Okay, so reach down and find your Bibles, and uh, let's find Esther. Ten-chapter book. If you're in Psalms or Proverbs or Job, then go to the left a little bit, and let's take the time to find Esther. I'm going to walk up here so you can see me, so I can illustrate this a little bit better. So here's Esther in my Bible, and it's only four or five pages. Here it is. And you'll notice that I'm not actually at the end of my Old Testament. And yet, in reality, Esther is the end of the Old Testament story. It's the end of the Old Testament story, the narrative, the story. It's done. If you flip a page, you'll notice that you're Job, and Job occurs somewhere in the neighborhood of when Abraham is alive. And then if you flip a few more pages, you'll see that you're in Psalms, 150 songs, and then you get into Proverbs, and then you're into all these prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and those minor prophets like uh, Jonah and Malachi. And so this extra portion, let me kind of show it to you just so we can learn for a minute here. From Job, I'm going to turn my pages here, Job to Malachi, this section of your Bible is actually part of these first books that we read. It's the end of your Bible for your Old Testament story is Esther. That's where we're at. We're at the end of the Old Testament story. In just a few years, this is it. We're going to go into 400 years of silence. And so that just try to set a little context. Now, cha- find chapter 4. We have an amazing verse, verse 14. It's worthy of our attention. And we're going to preach through all of Esther in the next couple of weeks. It won't take us long. Um, but it's an Old Testament book. And you say, why are we here? Because Joey said it to, it's a good book to preach. And so when Joey said it, I was done. Made it very simple. Verse 14. Ready? For if thou... All right, who is this? Mordecai is talking to Esther. We'll unpack all that in just a minute. Talking through a mediary. If thou altogether holdest thy peace, if you keep your mouth shut, if you silent, if you remain silent at this time, there shall, there shall their enlargement or relief or deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows? Now this is why we're here. This is, this is, I want you to underline in this in your Bible when you sit down. And who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Let's pray. Father, would you drive us to a sermon that is glorifying to yourself and to your son and to the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit of living God, would you come here and make a difference? Would you make a difference in a supernatural and spiritual way? Would you come and abide with us in this, your dwelling place, through your people whom you redeemed in your mighty name, amen. So we're going to preach through four chapters in one sermon. We've never done this in the history of Brian. Yes, sister, we're going to do it. We're going to get through four chapters, and we'll do our very best to be done somewhere in the neighborhood of noon. Somewhere in that neighborhood. Here's our sermon title, Mordecai's Eye for the Providence of God. Mordecai's Eye for the Providence of God. And like I tried to explain to you from the pulpit here, 
We're at the end of our Old Testament creation story. Those of you in the dudes class, you're going through this quite well to get a good feel of your Old Testament. That's creation, that's Adam and Noah, and, and, and uh, then the patriarchs, that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the Exodus, that's Moses delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt. And the conquest, that's Joshua leading them into the promised land. And then the judges we learned last week was 450 years, culminating with Samuel as the final judge who anoints Saul to be the first king of Israel. And then you remember the kingdom splits after Solomon in 722. Assyrians take out the Israelites. And in 586, the Babylonians take out Judah. And then we have 70 years of captivity or exile. And then Cyrus the Great issues the edict to allow the Israelites to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city in around 516 BC. And then we get to Esther really even under the return, so to speak. This is the final part of our Bible. This is the end of the Old Testament story. It's post Daniel and post Cyrus the Great and post Ezra. It's somewhere around 486 to 464 BC. The location of our story is modern day Iran. Some Jews have returned to Jerusalem to rebuild while others remained in locations of exile like Susa where our story takes place. Here's a summation of the entire 10 chapters. It's one long story, takes over 10 years to get through the entire thing. Uh, Not 10 years of preaching, 10 years of chronicle time uh, of God's providence and human responsibility involving a Jewish girl who becomes the queen of Persia and is willing to risk her life to save her people from a plot to destroy them. That's Esther. And every Christian should know about it. What makes this book in particular very unique is we can't find God's name in it. And it sets it apart. And yet we have a book in which God's name is not mentioned and he's all over the pages. His handiwork is everywhere in the story, which is a marvelous mystery. Most appropriate for this era, let me go back, the return era or the exile era, because remember, God hasn't been talking to them much and it seems like he's absent. And I would dare say that most of us have got times in our life where it feels like, where's God? And and are you there? And can I find you? And yet this story reminds us that even when it seems as though God's absent, he's still there. And his hand is still orchestrating the affairs of his kingdom in a marvelous way. And I want to do my best to unpack that for you. Five main characters. Let's get a hold of the first one. That's the king of Persia, uh, Ahasuerus, um, uh, or Xerxes, depending on if you have an ESV in your lap, Vashti, Mordecai, Esther, and Haman. Those are our five main characters of our story. Everything revolves pretty much around them. Verse 1, chapter 1. Let's get started. Follow along in your Bibles as we preach through four chapters. Huge kingdom, 127 providences. Four capital cities based on what we can uh, devise. One of which is Susa. Susa is located right over here. Uh, There's the Persian Gulf. Here's Egypt down here, Saudi Arabia. And there's the capital where our city takes place. Verse 3 says the king's having a massive party. I mean, this is a feast of feasts, and they are eating well and doing well. Verse 10 through 12 says the king came up with a great idea of parading his wife before the crowd. He's got a a looker of a wife. She is a babe, and he's going to let the whole world know that's my wife. And Vashti says, I ain't playing your game. I ain't coming out there and prayed in front of all those drunk men and showing off my beauty. And this creates a significant problem because when the king says to do something, you do it. Now, men, this is not today, okay? (laughs) This is many years ago. It doesn't work like that anymore. But in that time frame, when he said it, she had no choice and she refuses. This creates chaos in the castle or in the palace. What shall we do unto the queen according to the law because she has not performed the commandment of the king? 
Okay? And again, let's be clear, men. This is many years ago. All right? So don't expect this when you go home for lunch. And, and Okay. <laughs> It's always something, isn't it? All right. So, <laughs> fasting the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to the people that are in the providence of the king. So they really play this up and they say, hey, this is not just a little marital squabble here. She's the queen. And when she refused to do what the king says, this has ripple effects into the entire kingdom. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad. It's going to get a Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The whole world's going to find out that women can stop doing what they're told. There's going to have to be some consequences for our actions. The ladies of Persia and media will say to this day, if the queen can get by with it, we can too. All right, you see the consequences here. Thus there shall arise too much contempt and wrath. All of society is going to break into utter chaos if you let the queen get by with this. Y'all tracking? That's the idea. Verse 19, if it please, tracking by the way is a military, huh? maybe I should have used something different, right? Following along, is that better? Okay. If it please the king, there shall go a royal commandment. Now, this is great. All right, what we need is a commandment. We need to write up a law, and it's going to say she can't come in anymore. Now, this is awesome. I love the irony in the Bible. If you don't see the irony in the Bible, you're missing something. She don't want to come in the first place, okay? And so let's create a law that says you can't come. All right, no problem with the law. I didn't want to come there anyway. All right, there's five of you. All right, what is the... Pulse check. <laughs> All right, that's where you verify you're alive. Okay, listening to the sermon. Okay, all right, chapter two, let's move on. All right, at this point, we need a new queen. All right, gotta have, a, if you're a king, gotta have a new queen. And so the next morning, the queen, king wakes up from his drunken stupor with a hangover and realizes, what have I done? The Bible says that his wrath is appeased and he remembered Vashti. I cannot believe that those knuckleheads who work for me let me kick her out. And now he's done. Okay. So they, once again, the staff officers scramble because the king is in a mess and needs a queen. And so let there be a fair young virgin sought for the king. Now remember, we have 127 providences to go looking for a wife from. Let's find the best, the brightest. And of course, they've got to be good looking. Okay. He says, we're going to give them uh, their things for purification or beautification. This is awesome. Not a pulpit search committee, a queen search committee. We're going to organize this thing. All 127 providences, find the good looking ones, bring them back, and for 12 months, as much Mary Kay as you need, whatever you need, okay? <laughs> Curling irons, straighteners, beauty treatments, whatever you need. And then on a particular night, you're going to get to go before the king. That's kind of how this works. Let the maiden which pleases the king be queen instead of Asti. And the thing pleased the king. Of course it did. Okay? You got an entire committee finding you a wife. Okay? Some of you guys need... No, let's stop, stop there. Okay. <laughs> Verse 5. Okay. So we've got this guy by the name of Mordecai. We need to be introduced to who Mordecai is. His, his name was Mordecai. He was the son of Jared, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Those of you who know your Bibles, remember that Saul also was a son of Kish. So we've got a pretty significant family that Mordecai is coming from. Now, verse 6 says, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity. Now, this is not quite accurate in the sense of he wasn't physically carried away because that happened in 586, 100 years ago. So Mordecai would have to be old as dirt to be carried away in the days of Daniel. The idea is that his family was carried away, and that's why Mordecai is now living in exile. So, uh, he brings uh, Esther, it's called in the King James Bible, his uncle or his first cousin, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took as his own daughter. So you almost have like an uncle-niece relationship going on here. The ESV rendering verse 9 says, And the young woman Esther pleased him and won him favor. Now the him is not the king. We're not there yet. This is the guy in charge of the queen search committee. And she finds favor in his eyes. And so she gets the best beauty, uh, hairdressers, the best makeup, the best food and, uh, food, and really gets elevated in a position of prominence. And he quickly provided her with cosmetics and a portion of her food. And with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. 
Now we have to see, begin to see this 127 providences. We don't know how many, maybe a thousand women, 500 women. And suddenly she's finding favor. One of many. What's going on here? Verse 10. Esther had not showed the people her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she would not show it. So she doesn't tell anyone she's a Jew. Verse 15. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. This should immediately begin to resonate with you. And you should make some connections with some other biblical characters. Think about Genesis, for example. Who are you thinking about right now in Genesis? All right, you said Noah. Who else? Joseph, right. Think about what you know about Joseph. Joseph lands in Potiphar's house as a slave and finds favor. Joseph lands in prison and finds favor. Joseph's elevated out of prison and finds favor. In fact, it seems as though everywhere Joseph goes, God lays favor upon him. And that's what we need to pay attention to. Verse 16, so Esther was taken into the king in his royal house in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the other young maidens, so that he set the royal crown upon her head. And she's now the new queen of Persia. Uh, chapter 2, verses 21, 22, and 23. The king is saved from an assassination plot. Now, this is very important. It's a small detail. If you're reading this as your normal reading time, you might just gloss right over it, but it's pretty significant. Mordecai overhears two of the king's chamberlains plotting to lay their hands on the king. Mordecai does. Mordecai takes that information through a messenger to the queen, Queen Esther, who delivers it to the king. The king investigates it, finds out, yes, they were plotting to kill you, and he hangs the guys. Notice this last little phrase. And it's written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Now, we need to remember this. A written record of Mordecai's action to save the king is chronicled. God will use that in the future. Chapter 3. We're going to meet Haman. Haman becomes a hater of the Jews. We don't know much about Haman other than this short description, but the king likes him and promotes him. Haman promotes him to like a prime minister position. And he goes out and everybody's supposed to bow before Haman, but not Mordecai. Mordecai ain't playing the, king, the game, okay? For whatever reason, he refuses to bow. Everybody else is bowing, not Mordecai. That drives Haman crazy. Uh, I mean, that drives Morde uh, Haman crazy, Mordecai's refusal. Obviously, Haman wants to find out who is this guy, Mordecai, and he's told that he's a Jew. Verse 5, and Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did he reverence. Then Haman was full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai. Now, here's my take. Take it for what it's worth. I think Haman's a sissy. Okay? And, and the reason I say that is he won't just take out Mordecai himself. Okay? Okay? He doesn't have a vendetta against all Jews. It's Mordecai that's the problem, not everybody. Most of the rest of them are bowing. But because he doesn't want to deal with Mordecai personally, he creates a vendetta against all Jews because Mordecai's a Jew. This is kind of a backdoor way of taking care of Mordecai. I'm going to eliminate an entire race to take care of Mordecai. Therefore, Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. In the first month, in the mouth of Nisai, the twelfth year of King Asaharis, they uh, cast Pur. That is the lot. Now, we want to talk about this because it's a little bit confusing, and I was doing some research. Let's unpack this for a minute. How many of you have ever worked for a boss that you had to get in his office on just the right day? Because if you got the wrong day, man, it could just be terrible. All right, now no, the video cameras are not working this way, uh, looking. So you can be honest with us. It's okay. And some of you need to be transparent. It's kind of a, some therapy in letting the world know about that stuff. Um, the king is like this. So Haman cast a lot, like a dice. Now we don't know exactly what it was, to figure out what day he needs to approach the king. So he believes in a providence, so to speak, will decide the right day 
to present this idea before the king. Now, once again, we can't really relate to this too much, but I want to remind you that if you approach the king on the wrong day, it could cost you your life. You ain't calling an attorney and getting your day in court. The man has the authority just to execute you on the spot. So before Haman feels comfortable marching in to see the king with this idea of wiping out an entire ethnicity in his kingdom, he has to feel that the spirits are behind him, that the stars have been aligned, so to speak. Y'all following along? A little bit? Okay. That's the purr idea. Now we're going to have a feast later on, and that's why we need to remember this purr idea. So the lot is cast, and the day comes where Haman is now going to go see the king. And so here's the plot. Verse 8. Haman said to the king, There is a certain people scattered abroad, dispersed among the people in all the provinces of the kingdom, and their laws are different from all the people. They don't keep the king's law, therefore it's not the king's prophet. Now that's a lie. All right, that's a lie. The Jews were keeping the laws, and they did make them some money. That's just a pure lie. But you've got to tell the king such and such if you're going to get an ethnicity wiped out. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I'll fund the deal. See, look at it. I'll pay the 10,000 uh, talents of silver in the hands of those that have charge of the business to bring to the king's treasuries. So he comes with a ton of money and a desire to wipe out the Jews. The king hears the word, takes off his ring, which is the seal of approval, and says, go for it. Verse 11, and the king approves the funding and renders the edict. Verse 12, it's written in all the languages. Notice in the green for me, and in every people after their own language. You got to do that when you have 127 provinces, all kinds of cultures to get the word out. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day. One day has been designated, and we're going to wipe out all Jews, men and women, children. And not only that, whoever wipes them out gets to take whatever they belonged. So this is reap the spoils. Verse 15, and the couriers went out hurriedly by the order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa and Citadel. And now notice once again, the irony of verse 15. And the king and Haman sat down to have a drink. Who says that humans aren't depraved? Who says they're not depraved? How can you issue an edict to have an entire ethnicity wiped out and then go have a drink? And notice what the text says. But the city was thrown into confusion. Of course it was. They're in the palace having a beer, and the entire city is in chaos. The uh, Net Bible commentary was excellent. It says, the city of Susa was in uproar. This final statement of verse 15 is a sad commentary on the pathetic disregard of despots for the human misery. I just want to remind you, if you're a boss, know what it's like to be an employee. Don't ever get yourself so promoted that you lose touch with the flunkies. Because that's what we've got going on here. Chapter 4. Esther's got to do something. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out in the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. And it came before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In every province where the of the king's commandment went to, all the Jews are weeping, gnashing of teeth, calling out to God, in spite of the fact that it doesn't say calling out to God, that's what they're doing. Verse 4, And Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told her, and then the queen was exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai. She doesn't even know what's going on. She's so far removed from the situation, she has no idea what Mordecai's problem is. She sends clothes out there to put some clothes on him. Mordecai refuses and gave to him this um, messenger gave the commandment to find out what's going on. Verse 8, 7 and 8. Mordecai told him all that had happened to him in the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasury to destroy the Jews. So he gave him the copy of the writings. You get this? She hadn't seen it on Facebook. So he prints it up and hands it back to her so she can see what's going, going on. That's how disconnected she is from what's happening. That she should go into the king go into the king to make a supplication and to make a request. 
Esther sends this message. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king in the inner court who is not called, there's one law and is to be put to death. Now, folks, you've got to get this. Check back into the sermon, okay? This is the essence of where we're going. We can't fathom this. This, this is so countercultural that you're going to miss it. The standard is you don't go see the king. The king asks for you to come see him. You don't even make an appointment. He lives over here, and if he wants to see you, he'll let you know. Other than that, don't bother me. It's so isolated that if you decide to see him without being called, he has the authority by the law just to put you to death. So Mordecai is asking Esther to risk immediate execution. Now you've got to see this because we're not just reading Esther for the sake of reading Esther. We've got to run to Jesus. So we've got a woman, a woman who's being asked by Mordecai to risk her life. And verse 13 says, Mordecai writes back through this messenger, Think not thyself that thou shalt escape the king's house more than all the Jews. Don't you forget for a moment. I know you're living in the palace. I know you think you're removed from all this. But you're still a Jew. You're not getting a buy on this. So now we get to verse 14. If thou, talking to her through the messenger, holdest thy peace at this time. I mean, if you do this, then, then shall arisement, enlargement, relief, deliverance. It'll come from another place, another source. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And then we get to this little phrase. And who knows, because he can't say it definitively, but who knows if God hasn't orchestrated all this for this decisive moment in history. Amen. Now, that's the book. If, if you don't get this, then you shouldn't even come to church this morning because you miss the essence of the sermon. Now, I want to unpack this verse for the rest of the time we get to spend together. In one verse, one single verse, look at the depth and the doctrine. We have human free will. We have a covenant-keeping, sovereign God. We have human responsibility and God's providence. Now, those are four ideas all in the deep end of the pool. All of them in one verse. That's why we told you an entire story to get to one single driving point of a sermon. One verse. Let's start with the first one. Number one. Lesson number one. Esther's a free will being. Say, where are you getting that from? The word if. I want you to see it in your own Bible. He, very clearly, he says it like this. If, if thou altogether holdest thy peace. He doesn't, he doesn't see this as so sovereignly laid out that she's a robot. No, he says, you're going to have a choice. You have a decision to make right now. This is a legitimate statement from Mordecai. You as a queen, can say something or you can keep your mouth shut. You are well aware of a crisis. Somebody's going to die. And are you going to say something or are you going to keep your mouth shut? If you talk to any law enforcement officers, they will often talk about the inability to extract information from citizens who know stuff. They saw it, and they won't say anything, and they keep their mouth shut. And Mordecai says to, to uh, uh, Esther, if thou, if, if, if you decide to keep your mouth shut, if you make this decision, you have a choice. You have a choice. Esther can talk or not talk. She is not a robot. She's not a pawn piece on a chessboard uh, robotically going through a course of action predetermined without any decisions. No, she has a legitimate decision at this point. Will I do something or not do it? 
And so I want to ask this morning, has there ever been a time in the history of America where Christians are expected to keep their mouth shut more than now? I mean, it seems to me, the more I read, the more I see that the bulk of America wants us to find a little corner and stay in that corner and keep our mouths shut. We're not supposed to talk about the exclusivity of Christ. We're not supposed to remind the world that Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Instead, we're expected to embrace this uh, unbelievable ecumenical pluralism that says one religion is as good as another. Or has there ever been a time we're supposed to keep silent about God's expectation that all men everywhere, according to Acts 17, are commanded to repent? Or has there ever been a time we're supposed to keep silent about millions of innocent babies being aborted each and every single day with our tax-paying dollars? Ever been a time we're supposed to be silent about God's moral demands according to his law. Just be quiet. Don't talk, stop talking about that. Or how about the extreme laziness that's plaguing our society? Anybody besides me tired of paying taxes so somebody else can sit at home and do nothing? Anybody else besides me decided the size and scope of the federal government that's left its biblical mandate and has become a welfare state? And you know what happens? We keep silent. I'll tell you how we keep silent. We don't vote. That's the means of keeping silent. Sit at home. Can't find time. One day a year and you can't find time? Seriously? What a sack of nonsense. Amen, sir. How about, we're supposed to just ignore the fact that Common Core curriculum instituted by the federal government is indoctrinating our kids on Darwinism. And if you don't know what's going on with Common Core and you have your kid in a public school, pull your head out of the sand. Yes, sir. You better know exactly what's going on with Common Core. You've got kids in the public school system, you go meet those teachers and find out if you have a flaming teaching your kid. It's your children, not mine. Yeah. Amen. It's your responsibility. Yes. We have a bunch of Christians that are keeping silent when God's given them a mouth. Yes. So I want to draw even more application. How many times have you thought I should say something and kept silent? This would be a good time for you to wake up. You're kind of drifting through the sermon. This would be a good time to nudge your husband, get him to sit up a little bit and wake up. How many times have you thought I should say something? I should give a word of encouragement. I should give a word of clarity. I should give a word of exhortation. I should give a word of wisdom or grace. How many times has the Holy Spirit living inside you prompted you to say something and you five minutes later, 60 minutes later, one day later say, I should have said something. I, I want us as a church to get Mordecai's eyes. And what Mordecai has, an eye for the providence of God. Mordecai has a vision. When Mordecai puts on these glasses, he sees that God is sovereignly orchestrating the affairs of mankind to bring us to decisive moments when we're supposed to open our mouths and say something. Amen. And you have no idea that God may have that moment for you in the week. Tuesday afternoon, 3.06, orchestrated by God. You were delayed here. You went a little faster here. The line was quick over here, slowed down over here. And then, bam, in this carpet square, you meet so-and-so. And God gives you a chance to open your mouth. And you know what? You have a choice. Say something or remain silent. Yes. That's the purpose of this book. Proverbs 25, 11 says, The word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Six months ago, we had a young lady that was up here in this front pew, and she was just bawling her eyes out. Half a church walked by her, and not one person said anything. God gave us mouths. We're not monkeys. We can speak. All right, lesson number two. Esther's silence 
will not thwart God's ability to preserve his people. All right, where'd you get that from? Look at it with me, please. I want you to see how we extract the lessons from the Bible. We're not just making things up. They come from the text. This is what we call text-driven preaching. If thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, there then shall there their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. You will not keep God from saving his people. These are his people. He is the sovereign. He will keep his covenant. He made it with Abraham. And it doesn't matter what Hitler decides to do. They are his people. And he will preserve his people. There's no one in hell because you didn't say a word. If God chooses to save someone, he will orchestrate the affairs to get them saved. Now you personally might miss out on the blessing of being the intended recipient of the one that got to share the gospel because you wouldn't open your mouth. But God in his divine providence brings another one in and another one in and another one in and another one in because his will will be accomplished. Now, we must understand this because anything less than this reduces God's sovereignty. When we subordinate so-and-so's ability to get saved because I didn't say anything, is to suggest that God can't use other instruments, and that is absurd. But for us, for such a time as this, I was the intended object of God's providence. And my refusal to obey the Holy Spirit keeps me from being the intended recipient of blessing and reward. And God moves to another person. Nod your head if you're following what I'm saying just a little bit. Now I want to ask, by what authority or confidence can Mordecai make such a statement? And you should already know this, but it's the Abrahamic covenant. God made it with Abraham and said, you will have a people. And I'm going to bless those that bless you. I'm going to curse those that curse you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to give you descendants as the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea or the grains of the sea. And I'm going to give you a chunk of land. And by the way, one more time, just so we're utterly and uberly uh, uh, straight in this church, that's precisely why we believe God still has a plan for Israel. We do not believe in covenant theology that replaces Israel with the church. We believe that God still has a people called Israel, and I could argue it the rest of the sermon, if time would permit, from this, this book alone. Next slide. Let me click it real quick. Lesson three. Plenty of time. We're there. While Esther is a free will being who can choose not to do the courageous thing, her refusal to do the right thing comes with consequences. Where'd you get that from? Look back at your Bible. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. Okay. Mordecai says, you are a free will being. And your free will can take you right down the path of destruction. Now, now God will save his people, but don't think for a minute that that salvation includes you when you don't do a thing. So you do have a choice to make. You do have a choice to make. And God in his providence will take care of his people that he made a covenant with. But as for you, you can expect to be destroyed. You're not getting a buy. Think about the application of this. It's significant. You can reject Christ. You want that free will to reject Christ? You got it, but you can't reject Christ and not go to hell. Let's continue. You can divorce your spouse. Yep, I'm going to do it. Okay, but you can't keep yourself from the consequences. You go 95 miles an hour, you're a free will being. Take your free will and mash that gas pedal down. But when you're in handcuffs, you are the recipient of the consequent of your free will choice. So deal with it. And don't you dare blame God on your problems. 
don't you get angry with God and cause an attitude with God and now you're bitter with God and all that when you made the choice. Amen. You made it. It's not God's fault. Right. Okay, we're not going to pin it on God and then cop an attitude with God because of the choice you made. Right. Okay, so we want it both ways. That's really what we want. It. We want all the free will to reject as much as we want, but then when that has a consequence with it, we're angry with God that he's created such a consequence. Number four, Esther must realize, and not just realize, be motivated by the reality that God has orchestrated her selection to be the queen of Persia for this decisive moment in the history of salvation. Not, not only must she realize it, but understanding the degree to which God sovereignly orchestrates the affairs of mankind needs to give her the courage to step out in faith and go see the king. And not just an intellectual awareness. Knowing, okay, yeah, God does this. No, it needs to be more than that. I need to get up in the morning. I need to get up in the morning. And I need to put my providential glasses on. So that I can see the reality that God is directing my day. And I'm shifting back and forth in, to, in order to hopefully illustrate to you that the delay that you thought that was confident and attitude was intended by God so that you could bump into so-and-so. And then when you bumped into so-and-so and you saw that their heart was hurting and you had no intention of seeing them and the Holy Spirit impresses upon you to say something, then do it! Then open your mouth. Every day get up with the idea that I serve a living God who orchestrates my past so that I can be his servant or instrument of grace or deliverance or words of wisdom or instruction or gospel words. Yeah, amen. Y'all got it? Yeah. That's the idea. This is not an accident. It's not a coincidence. Instead, God's hand of guidance has caused in such a way that one person can save many from being destroyed. We need to have a vision for God's providence so we don't keep silent. Would you turn to John 11? Let's run to Jesus at the end of our sermon. Pretty good place to run? John 11. Now let me remind you that John 11 is the great chapter in which Christ delays his arrival so that Lazarus can be good and dead. And no doubt, this dude is dead. Okay, he's, he's already begun to stink. All right, he's dead. Okay, this, this is, he's finished. Look at verse 45 with that context. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. So, so we've got more and more people believing on Christ. They're believing. Souls are being changed. Lives are are being impacted. Jesus is having his intended purpose in drawing men and women to himself, and folks are becoming followers of Christ. Verse 46. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then, verse 47, gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees and counsel and said, what, what, what do we for this man doth many miracles. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Do you see the parallels? If you don't, reread it this afternoon because they are incredible. It makes our book so special. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, 
nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. You could just write down Esther right there in the margin of your Bible to see the connection. Don't you see it? Folks, forget about the gender difference. Esther is a type of Christ. She's a beautiful type of Christ who has to be willing to risk her life in order to save her people. It's, it's, just, it's just incredible. And what you should find, once again ironic, is that Caiaphas is being used as an instrument of God with his free will to talk about the gospel. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but also that he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. This is why Paul can say we are sons of Abraham. And then from that day forth, they took counsel together to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country near the wilderness, into the city of Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. Christ being willing to die for the sins of the whole world so that you and I can be saved. And we will see next week what Esther does. Let's pray.